Renaissance people, if you are enjoying the Italian Renaissance podcast, I have good news. We're now active on Patreon. You can show your love for the show by becoming a patron and get access to additional resources, information, and artworks. Better yet, Those who join the Renaissance Master or Renaissance Patron tier will get access to at least one additional podcast episode each month. My goal is to ensure that the main podcast remains a free, accessible source for everyone. Become a patron today through the link in the show notes to support the continued production of new episodes and help build and maintain this community. The Italian Renaissance Shop is now also active on Etsy, linked in the show notes. Sport our logo or choose from a growing selection of Italian art-inspired designs. Discounts are offered to select Patreon tiers as well. Your support has my immortal gratitude. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Italian Renaissance Podcast, where we discuss the culture and art of 15th and 16th century Italy. I'm your host, Lawrence Gianangeli. Andiamo avanti. Renaissance people? After what I hope was a thrilling look at some of the architecture and sculpture of Renaissance Venice, I want us to return to exploring the rich painting tradition that was developed at the turn of the century from the 1400s to the 1500s, the same period that saw the new sculptural innovation of the Lombardo family that we talked about last time. The artist central to our discussion today is one Giorgio da Castelfranco, better known as Giorgione, Big George. He was born in the end of the 1470s in the town of Castelfranco Veneto, which was under the Venetian Republic. Giorgione had a very short but very impactful career, dying of the plague in 1510. Should you recall our discussion of Venetian Plague Islands that I discussed for uh, the Halloween special, Giorgione actually died in quarantine on the island of Lazaretto Nuovo, not the dreaded Povelia, though the same quite tragic situation. His short life of less than 40 years did not hinder his impact on Renaissance painting, as he is known to be one of the most influential masters of the Venetian High Renaissance, along with his contemporaries Titian and Sebastiano del Piombo. A lot of what we know of his life comes from Giorgio Vasari, who sometimes tends to embellish and exaggerate his stories, yet the lives of the artists, as Um, it was called, has a very strong Florentine bias. So it is significant who Vasari included in his book from outside the realms of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, who he was writing for. We can also understand that he was not entirely familiar with the intricacies of Venetian art. We can confirm that Giorgione left Casalfranco Veneto at a young age and arrived in Venice. He apprenticed in the workshop of Giovanni Bellini, who was at that time in his 70s, around 1500. But still, he had quite a bit of work left in him, since he didn't pass away till 1516. Giorgione, therefore, developed his skills under the tutelage of the Bellini workshop. So, in writing about Giorgione and his style as it relates to the Bellini workshop and to Florentine art, Vasari tells us that, quote, he was so under nature's domination and imitated it so well that not only did he acquire a reputation for having surpassed Gentile and Giovanni Bellini, but also for rivaling those artists working in Tuscany who were the authors of the modern style, end quote. We have to be cautious to accept the face value of what Vasari considers, quote, modern style, unquote. Remember, strong Florentine bias here, although to consider Giorgione as a rival to it is really a form of high praise. 
Likewise, Giorgione appears in the third part of the Lives, it's written in three parts, which is a collection of artists who Vasari considered to have perfected five qualities of painting, rule, order, proportion, design, and style. Vasari determines that this culminates ultimately in Michelangelo, who he believes to be under divine inspiration, pure perfection in art and creation. So, when Vasari claims that Giorgione is, quote, under nature's domination, or, as the original text read, tanto le fu soggetto, that he was subjected to it, as opposed to having domination over nature, we can try to think about how Vasari is conceptualizing Giorgione's work as similarly divinely inspired. The alternative is that Vasari considered Giorgione too dependent on nature, subject to it, rather than to his own will as an artist. I'm not entirely sure how to read it, so I will leave that one open for you to consider. The word we use today, mimesis, or the ability to imitate nature in art, was among the most praiseworthy qualities for Vasari and his circle of typically noble class wealthy men who engaged art as a social practice. So Vasari depicts Giorgione's Giorgione's mimetic abilities, mimetic abilities, his ability to do mimesis, to show nature, as something he is subject to by nature itself, promoting the idea that both nature is acting as an external divine force in his work, and that it is the very nature of his own existence, presumably ordained by God, to be able to paint in a manner that he does that makes his skills rival to the Florentines. Right? I think I got that. However, Vasari is going to include some practical elements about Giorgione's style that show an influence of Tuscan art, right? Vasari is always going to reintegrate his native idiom, but there's some historical truth to it, okay? Vasari tells us that, quote, Giorgione had seen some of the things done by Leonardo that were very subtly shaded off and darkened through the use of deep shadows. And this style pleased him so much that while he lived, he always went back to it, imitating it most especially in his oil paintings. Vasari is telling us that Giorgione was influenced by a great Florentine painter, someone you might have heard of at least once or twice, Leonardo da Vinci. The subtle shading Vasari is talking about is certainly the sfumato technique that Leonardo developed. Leonardo observed that painting should be done in accordance with the way the eye sees, and the eye does not typically detect sharp outline this linear quality that many Florentine schools used in their paintings. Sfumato blurs those lines, gives them a smokiness, that's sort of what it means, that make the image closer to how the eye sees in nature, which in turn makes an image closer to nature and thus closer to divinity because nature is a creation of the divine. Do we understand that? Giorgione had seen Leonardo's work possibly when Leonardo passed through Venice in the year 1500 and integrated sfumato into his own style. I want to direct you towards his painting in in, in the London National Gallery, The Adoration of the Magi, from around 1506 by Giorgione. This is an oil on wood panel painting, although Giorgione will predominantly use oil on canvas. Look at the detail of the Virgin and the Christ Child. Not only does the outline of the figures have a blurry sfumato quality, but the modeling and shading of the figures are smooth and delicate. That gradation in in tone of shadow, right, is very Leonardesque, so to speak. Look at the way the Virgin Mary's hair shimmers. It's simultaneously textured, but it's smooth. Another mimetic gesture, an attempt to show her as the eye might perceive her. Leonardo was not the only influence on Giorgione's style. 
Notably, German Renaissance master Albrecht Dürer made several voyages to Venice, and he also produced works which were heavily influenced by Leonardo, particularly conceptualizing painting subjects as having both an outward physical expression, what you see, and an internal spiritual expression, what's going on inside of them, their spirit, their soul. The thing is, it's not always determinable how the interaction of the two produce a given meaning. All of these visual elements, coupled with a very rich literary culture in Venice, particularly in regard to Venice as an essential center for book printing. With printing available, written works were more easy to produce. As such, pastoral poetry, contemporary local works from authors like Pietro Bembo, or printings of Petrarchan sonnets and canzonieri were growing in influence. Giorgione's ability to combine references ultimately obscures meaning in many of his works. I will explain. We are talking a culmination of several major influences that contribute to Giorgione's unique style. The Bellini workshop in Venice where he trained, Leonardo's Tuscan influence, perhaps some northern renaissance from Dürer, and this rich literary culture. Together, they impacted Giorgione's work to create a type of painting that is new to the Renaissance, and indeed a launching point for an entire genre of painting that follow his influence. What Giorgione creates is a genre of painting that is centralized on a mood and atmosphere rather than a clear subject, depending on the image as a form of poetic language. This means that a lot of Giorgione's works are not as legible as, say, the Adoration of the Magi that we briefly looked at for the Sfumato, which follows some pictorial conventions and familiar iconography. They can take on more obscure forms in this poetic medium. A stunning example, one that I want to spend a bit more time unpacking, is the so-called Laura, or Portrait of a Young Woman, a painting signed and dated by Giorgione from the year 1506. The work is in Giorgione's preferred medium, oil on canvas. The canvas is placed over a board of spruce wood. We know the painting was actually larger than it is today, which would have set the figure back into the frame more, but now that some of the areas have been cut off and the size has been reduced, she appears more in the foreground. I don't mean more in the foreground. She is essentially the foreground. She imme more immediate to the viewer, okay? Let's look at some of the visual details first and then see how they align with the various influences working to inform Giorgione's style. This is the portrait of a female sitter. She sits in three-quarter pose but does not actually engage the viewer directly. Note that in the middle of the Quattrocento, portrait conventions were changing, more importantly, the mode in which male and female portraits were read were treated differently from one another. Access to the glance of a sitter is always significant, which Leonardo gives us access to through his female sitters. Yet, Giorgione denies us Laura's glance. I'm going to call her Laura. I want to be clear that that is not the title she was given. That is an assumed title based on, based on the portrait itself. We'll get into that. She has quite a pale complexion, which sharply contrasts this very dark background. She's wearing a fur-trimmed coat that has opened up. It's exposing one of her breasts. We're going to talk about that, too. A thin veil covers the back half of her head and slivers down her shoulder, wrapping itself around the exposed breast and emphasizing it. Equally notable, a large laurel branch springs up from behind her, hence the name Laura, after the laurel tree. In fact, that's where my name comes from too, which is kind of cool. Lawrence, meaning um, from some Latin, uh, a man from Laurentum, an ancient Roman city associated with the laurel tree. Likewise, note that the laurel crown is used to depict the famous Tre Corone, 
Dante, Boccaccio, and Petrarch, and even the Medici family used the laurel as a, a, as a symbol in their, their commission paintings. It has long been suggested that this is a depiction of Petrarch's Laura, of which the name served as a poetic device, although there are suggestions that he had fallen in love with an actual woman named Laura. Right? So if you know Petrarch, he's always writing about Laura, so it's a debate whether or not Laura is a made-up name that he's using because it has these strong uh, inclinations, allusions to poetry, or if there was an actual woman named Laura that, that he was in love with. All that tells us is that Giorgione has either adopted or adapted the name, the same as Petrarch, or not, right? Because he's not actually using the name, but the, 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 the symbol of the laurel and what that might mean, both of which serve the same poetic function. Does that make sense? The use of the laurel tree and the interpreted, uh, interpreted designation of Laura to the painting is central to how we conceptualize Giorgione's poetic painting. Now, part of analyzing Giorgione is that we cannot always say for sure what the subject matter is. We're merely exploring the most evident possibilities in trying to read and sort through his very complicated poetic language. If you recall that the Quattrocento saw a fully operational printing press in Venice, by 1501, a new edition of Petrarch's already well-known Canzoniere was printed there. Canzoniere or Rime Sparse, whatever you want to call it, it's both. It is possible that Giorgione is demonstrating the poetic capacity of painting, depicting Laura as an interaction between painting and poetry, where the painted image can produce the same effect of a poetic verse, that is, multiple layered interpretive meaning. The laurel itself is not only a specific reference to Petrarch, or to poetry in general, but it is used in various other means as a symbol of virtue, that is, virtue with a capital V. It becomes difficult, though, to reconcile virtue with the blatant eroticism of the work. Should you visit the, and I always say this weird, Kunsthistorische Museum website in Vienna, the collection that holds this work, they state that, quote, the half-revealed breast and the laurel have led to various mutually contradictory interpretations, end quote. Giorgione is using multiple signifiers to obscure any certain meaning of his work, though we should consider that contradiction is central to Petrarch's poetry and thus may be manifesting in Giorgione's work here. Speculative. Petrarch has both a sense of divine love for his Laura and an evident erotic love for her. His suffering derives from both not being able to be with, with her, with Laura, since she's died of plague halfway through his, his collection, and the fact that he cannot reconcile his erotic desire for her with his deep religious beliefs. Giorgione is tapping into that paradox, displaying both the virtue of divine love and poetry with a human sense of desire and admiration. Further, as a republic that enjoyed a somewhat more relaxed societal structure, where a certain courtesan culture flourished, gives the context of this painting uh, a bit more zest. Briefly, though, this is an entirely separate historical topic, but a courtesan in Venice and Italy was a variety of upper-class sex worker. And there were many in Venice. There were many in Italy. Rome also had a thriving courtesan culture. Okay, so it has been suggested that Giorgione is evoking the courtesan in relation to his demonstration of virtue. It's quite the paradox. Tom Nichols, this great author that we always come back to, summarizes this interaction perfectly, writing specifically about the poetic language of Giorgione's Laura. He says, quote, it is no coincidence that Giorgione's painting features a sexually alluring young woman, and thus one whose role within the patriarchal culture of Venice and its imagery had remained strictly circumscribed. Giorgione offers a glimpse into an altogether more 
private world in which sex and desire predominate over patriotism or piety, end quote. I love that. Sex and desire predominate over patriotism or piety. Giorgione creates this image for a private patron. Very important. Not for the Republic, not for the Church, not for the Scuole Grandi, which was really in part a departure from what the Bellini were predominantly doing as professional painters, although the Bellini painted for private collections as well, to be clear. Giorgione's preference or access to a more private clientele helped promote his poetic and erotic interactions with literally and figuratively veiled components of Venetian culture. See what I did there. All of this is happening alongside a series of references that inform both meaning and the visual appearance of the painting. Should we remember that Leonardo produced a new type of female portrait, one cannot help but to look at Laura alongside Leonardo's Geneva de Benci in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., or his lady with an ermine in Krakow, Poland, painted in the mid-1470s and late-1480s, respectively. With Ginevra, her very name evokes the juniper tree which Leonardo paints behind her as if to give her a crown of juniper, much like the, the use of Giorgione's laurel, uh, laurel tree, except for Leonardo, the juniper tree is a consequence of the landscape, and for Giorgione, the laurel, the laurel tree, laurel tree <laughs> is attached, so to speak, to his sitter. Leonardo's Krakow piece, The Lady with Ermine, likewise demonstrates a shift in background, substituting a window or a landscape for a thick and almost even black background. Note that Gentile Bellini also experimented with a solid, solid black background in his portraits, as did Antonello da Messina, that wonderful Sicilian oil painter who influenced the Bellini, all working in Venice in the late Quattrocento. What is the lady with the ermine looking at? She looks off to something as if startled. What are any of these women thinking? What is it about them that is not just a representation of their outward appearance? These portraits prompt us to explore these women and their inner consciousness through their eyes, through their expression, all three masterfully crafted in oil paint. Unlike Leonardo, who seems to prefer painting female portraits, Giorgione, uh, Giorgione only paints two that we know of. Still, it seems clear to me through Vasari, through scholarship, through looking at our examples and visually comparing them, that Giorgione does indeed hone his own style to Leonardo's pictorial innovation. Yet, it becomes unique and interactive. Where Leonardo looks to give you access to the sitter through their glance, using symbolic means to present a particular person to you, all specificity is lost in Giorgione. His poetic, interpretive, paradoxical mode of painting taking its place. Scholar Anne Christine Junkerman offers a powerful analysis of this painting in her article, The Lady and the Laurel, Gender and Meaning in Giorgione's Laura. First, she remarkably points out that the woman may indeed be wearing a male garment. This fur-lined outerwear that you see her in, in fact, she references Giorgione's Adoration of the Magi that we talked about, where the magus wears a similar piece of clothing among other sources that, that she uses to substantiate this argument. Junkerman is clear that the contemporary Venetian would recognize what Laura is wearing is a male garment. What is more, the figure is pulling the garment back, intentionally revealing the breast herself. How do we interpret a woman in a man's clothing who is adorned with symbols of virtue, especially in understanding the complicated relationship of gender dynamics and the importance of chastity during the Renaissance? For Junkerman, there is an undoubted tension here between possible readings and the values associated with those readings. 
She asserts that the portrait cannot simply be a Petrarchan Laura, especially through this gesture of revealing her own breast. Junkerman says that her, je- quote, her gesture of seduction belies the chilly virtue of Petrarch's lady. This woman, not blonde, is not Laura. Instead of being inscribed as poetry, she has, with an active gesture, dared to inscribe herself. End quote. And Junkerman continues that, quote, I would suggest that the several meanings of the laurel, certainly accessible to Giorgione and his clients, work in unison here, washing the painting with subtle associations rather than reducing its communication to a single discursive line. End quote. Through his choices in composition, physical attributes, gesture, color, garment, Giorgione complicates the coding of this painting, complicates the gender, the concept of virtue, and the entirety of the visual symbolic language. I have only offered a small foray into the extended possible readings of Giorgione's Laura, which should help to clarify that we are not talking about finding any clear answers to this type of painting. I want to leave us here, but this is not the last we will see of good old Big George. No, indeed, he produces other works that will be central to our understanding of how cultural cross-currents are enabling the development of Venetian painting which by the 1500s is beginning to turn in new directions. We did not even address his landscapes, a central component of his poetic style. Giorgione will be survived by his contemporaries Titian and Sebastiano del Piombo, as well as his own master Giovanni Bellini. Yet it is mainly through Giorgione's early innovation that these other painters will find inspiration, the next step in the development of Venetian painting. I want to reiterate and summarize that Giorgione innovated painting into a poetic and paradoxical form with readings that do not conform to one another, one that interacted with issues in his contemporary culture and society. We did not look at a great deal of his works yet. We saw briefly how he adopted the sfumato technique in Adoration of the Magi, As a standard practice of his, he does use sfumato in Laura as well, a portrait that draws on conventions established by Leonardo da Vinci and the rich poetic tradition of Italy in the 14th through the 16th centuries. Yet the departure from standardized codes and interpretable norms makes Giorgione's work a new way of painting that troubles and elaborates those conventions. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I have really enjoyed diving into Giorgione's work and trying to understand their intricacies so that I can present them to you. As always, I will steadily be posting these images with supplementary information on Facebook and Instagram. Like us and follow us to get updates and all the additional content posted there. Thank you to everyone who has supported the show directly. If you are really enjoying the show and would like to contribute, you can do so through the link in the show notes. I am eternally grateful. We are going strong on our journey through Renaissance Venice, and we are not stopping soon. So thank you all for joining me on this voyage, and until next time, arrivederci.